Father, thank you so much for uh, just the gift of singing. Father, what a joy it is to be able to come into your presence when, with brothers and sisters in Christ and collectively and corporately to just be able to join our hearts together in lifting your worth and praise to your very throne room. Father, we, we know that we have gathered here to worship a God who is great and mighty. And Father, we also understand that as we worship and praise you through singing, it's also edifying to us. It's the truth of the gospel sung over our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. And this draws us closer to you. And Father, it's a, it's a part of what you use in our life and in our worship to make us more Christ-like. Thank you for those this morning that are leading us in this time of of singing and, and, Father, entering into your throne room of worship before you. Lord, thank you so much for, for bringing just a little bit of what heaven's going to be like down to earth this morning and letting us engage in this. Thank you for your, your mightiness. Thank you for your greatness. Thank you for your holiness. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your justice. Thank you for who you are. And then thank you that in Christ Jesus, You've made us right with you through repentance and faith in him and him alone. Father, we, we understand that we've gathered here today for more than just a tradition or, or uh, just some routine that we go through. This is worship of a holy God. And Father, we thank you for giving us time out of our day to just, just take a moment, to just breathe, to just relax to be still in your presence as the busyness of the semester is going on, as we're preparing and thinking about Thanksgiving. Father, to just sit in your presence. And Father, have you do in our hearts what only you can do. And Father, we, uh, we want this, we desire this, we ask of you that you would make what we do in this place a part of how you're growing and maturing us spiritually. And then help us to measure where we are before you with how our hearts overflow when we gather together in this place. We just pray that you would be with us now as we continue. Help us to continue in the same heart that we've begun. And we just pray Jesus would be glorified through all of it. And Father, we often say in order to be the people that you've called us to be, to to live out the gospel, to proclaim the gospel in this world, we need a word from you. And so today, corporately and collectively, we say, speak for your servants are indeed listening. Father, be with those that can't be with us. Be with those that are continuing to travel for our seminary. And be with us as we look towards the break next week. Help us to enter into it being thankful and more than anything, thankful for the gospel of Jesus Christ that was proclaimed to us and we get to proclaim to others. And all of these things we give you and pray in the matchless and mighty name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen and amen. Before this time in the service, would you uh, stand with me in preparation for the reading of God's Word? Coming to read God's Word for us today is uh, one of our master's students, Corey Jones. And I believe Corey's going to come read to us from the book of Deuteronomy. Corey, come and lead us now during this time. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 1 through 8. Now listen, Israel, to the statutes and ordinance I am teaching you to follow, so that you may live, enter, and take possession of the land the Lord, the God of your fathers, is giving you. You must not add anything to what I command you or take anything away from it, so that you may keep the commands of the Lord your God I am giving you. Your eyes have seen what the Lord did at Baal of Pure for the Lord your God destroyed every one of you who followed Baal of Pure. But you, who have remained faithful to the Lord your God, are all alive today. Look, I have taught you statutes and ordinances as the Lord my God has commanded me, so that you may follow them in the land you are entering to possess. Carefully follow them, for this will show your, your wisdom and understanding in the eyes of the peoples. When you hear about these statues, they will say, this great nation is indeed a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God near to it as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call to him? And what 
great nation has righteous statues and ordinance like this entire law I set before you today. The word of the Lord. Well, if you have your copy of God's Word, and I pray that you do this morning, would you join me in Matthew chapter 18? Matthew chapter 18, and we're going to look together at verses 21 through ther- verse 35. It's a passage of Scripture, a parable that you probably know well. It's a, a passage of Scripture that we think of concerning the subject of forgiveness and specifically looking at the parable of the unforgiving servant. As we look at this passage of scripture this morning, let me read verses 21 and 22. This is what the word of the Lord says. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. I don't know about you, but I have experienced, experienced situations before in which I find out that one truth or one concept or one praxis that seems to be completely unrelated to another truth, concept, or praxis is actually intimately connected to that other truth. Usually this is very surprising when I find this out, but sometimes it's instrumental in me really understanding or improving in a certain area. Let me give you an example of a component of my life that doesn't really matter that much at all, hopefully to illustrate this concept. I play golf. I don't play golf often, and I don't play golf well, but those aren't components that you have to have to say that you play golf golf. I I remember the first time I was on the golf course that someone was someone that I would say is really good, that's genuinely a golfer. It's a friend of mine by the name of Vernon Ball that lives in South Carolina. He was so good at golf that he played college golf very competitively and he had, before he went into youth ministry, he had the opportunity to enter in, into the junior tour for the sake of attempting to o- earn his tour card, which he decided the Lord wasn't calling him to do, so he ended up going into youth ministry. Golf and youth ministry, Dr. Odom, those go hand in hand, I'm sure. So uh, if you're good at one, you're probably great at the other. But I was on the golf course with Vernon, and he watched me swing a couple times. He said, Adam, do you know what's wrong with your golf swing? And I said, Vernon, we don't have time for that, man. I mean, the list is probably so lengthy we couldn't get through it. He goes, no, just a couple things here. And so he began to share with me things about the golf swing, some of which I knew were intimately related, you know, like your grip. You know, the way you're holding the golf club, that's really affecting the way that you're able to get through the ball and some of those things. But then he really blew my mind. He said, but really the biggest problem you have in your golf swing is it's your stance. It's the way you're standing. Wait a minute, man. That, that really, I, you could say my shoulders. You could say, you know, my, my hip turn. You can say the way I'm holding the club. But really at the end of the day, man, it's all upper body. It has nothing to do. One has nothing to do with the other. My golf swing really and how well I'm hitting the ball has nothing to do with my stance. And he said, no, it absolutely has everything to do with your stance. Your golf swing is built from the ground up. And he's absolutely right. If your foundation isn't right, then the rest of what you're doing can't be effective. That's when I learned when some praxis was intimately related to another one that originally I had no idea was the case. In the passage of Scripture that we're looking at today, Peter asked a question. And it's an important question. It's an important question really for every believer, perhaps everybody that lives on the face of this planet. But what Jesus is going to do here, what Jesus is going to teach, what Jesus is going to develop, is he's going to show Peter and really the rest of us that it is intimately connected to another truth as it relates to living in the kingdom that's even more foundational than the question that Peter's asking. But it does begin with Peter questioning or engaging our Lord, the King of the kingdom, with not an insignificant question. So I want us to look again at verses 21 and 22 in the area of this text that we might call Peter's probing. Listen again. 
Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Upon first blush or first glance at Peter's question, it just seems to come out of the blue, doesn't it? You saw all of a sudden here Peter is and he looks at Jesus and says, I've got a good one for you. How many times do I forgive my brother when he sins against me? I mean, it almost seems like it's just ambiguous. It's completely out of the blue. It's, it's out of nowhere. It's one of those things that's out of nowhere. It's like, Peter, what's going on in your mind? What in this moment would lead you to ask Jesus, hey, let's talk a little bit about forgiveness and let me know how many times so I can check the box off, I need to forgive someone that wrongs me. Perhaps it's not that random at all, though. In some ways, even if we just begin in verse 21 and begin to work our way from there, maybe it's not random at all because isn't this a question somewhere deep down in our minds that maybe or deep down in our souls all of us wonder about? Like, How many times do I need to say I'm a fo- if I'm a follower of Jesus, do I need to forgive someone else? Maybe it's essentially a human question. Maybe even if you're not even a follower of Jesus. Maybe you just live in this world and because we are broken People who do ourselves need forgiveness, maybe we find ourselves asking, how often do I need to forgive someone else, one particular person that's wronged me? It's just the basics of of human operation. It's just foundationally, to some extent, who we find ourselves. But we can even go a step further here. Can you imagine being physically in the presence of Jesus? Let me say it like this. The ultimate forgiving one and maybe in that instance it's on your heart and mind even more you've seen the character of Jesus you've seen how he conducts himself the grace and love and mercy and almost perpetual forgiveness that he himself has in himself and that he came to extend to everyone and maybe you just can't get out of the way of asking the question because you know you yourself don't really have that own measure in your own heart and so in the presence of Jesus you look and you go man I am really broken in the area of forgiveness and I need to know Jesus I I can't forgive like you do, but Jesus, I need to know how much forgiveness, what measure of forgiveness is required of me. So maybe it's not, again, random at all. You ever thought about Jesus' forgiveness? He's the ultimate forgiving one. And his forgiveness is unlike anyone else's forgiveness in the history of the world in that he's the only one who extends forgiveness that he himself has never had to be forgiven. So when you're in that type of presence, probably what comes to the fore of your mind on more than one occasion, perhaps Peter had thought about this many times and he finally got up the nerve to ask him, Jesus, I don't think I'm like you. I'm struggling. But can you tell me from your perspective, from the truth of your own mouth right now, how much do I need to forgive? Because I know I can't forgive that much. Now, the only thing to some extent that may seem even more random than Peter's question on first glance is the answer that he gives, right? Jesus, I'm not going to wait for you to answer because you might take it further than I want to, so let me just throw out a number. Jesus, how about seven? How about seven times? That's, that sounds like a good number. That seems random to us too. The question seems random at first. The, the answer seems random. What in the world is Peter getting at? Until you understand that the Pharisees taught that religious righteousness meant you had to extend forgiveness to someone three times. So Peter says, well, I'll do better than that. I'll double it. No, 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 no. Jesus, I'll even go a step further. I'll double it plus one. Look how righteous I am. I'm the epitome of graciousness, Jesus. Peter thought he was being like profound. So maybe the only thing that blows us out of the water more than even Peter's question is Jesus' answer, which I'm I'm certain at this point blew Peter out of the water. And Jesus says, no, I tell you what, not just seven times, but 70 times times seven. Now, you understand that Jesus wasn't giving Peter the occupation of a mathematician at this point. 
He wasn't saying, so do quick mathematics and find out what number that actually is. And that's the length, that's the extent, that's the horizon of how much you have to forgive. No, essentially Jesus is again being metaphorical and he's saying, Peter, you have to get, forgive an innumerable, an infinite amount of time. How, how much do we struggle just think about Peter's question here for a moment and can we put ourselves in this category and can we be honest and real for just a moment and go how much do we struggle with forgiveness and and, and maybe even on a broader scale right now and, and I don't want to go too far with this because I know we can but when we look even not just personally but on a, on a corporate scale, on to some extent maybe even within our churches, the things that we hear that are wrong, that people do, that maybe we don't even know personally. How good are we at forgiving? Maybe we say those personal relationships were really good at forgiving, but when we look at some things out there, we just look and go, well, those things are unforgivable. Even a term we have for it, right? The length the extent of our forgiveness, there's something that's unforgivable. I, I would be lying to you if I didn't say what's on my heart and mind right now. And I'm not thinking about anybody in particular, but we just think about, to some extent, the, 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 the corporate or the public failings that we've seen to some extent, even in our own convention, in our own churches, some very high profile, some less, less profile of, I, I'll just say, for in my area, pastoral ethical failings. And we look at that and we go, is there any forgiveness? If, if a guy does steal money from the church that he's called to shepherd and serve, is there any forgiveness there? Can forgiveness be extended there? If a guy is unfaithful to his wife amongst the flock that he's calling to faithfulness in Jesus, is there any forgiveness there? Can that person be forgiven? Can the wife forgive? Can the leadership of the church can forgive? Can the church itself, can the congregation forgive? Can we forgive? I, I'm reminded when I think about that on a very maybe impersonal scale of a very personal story. I remember when my mentor, Dr. Stephen Smith, told the story in chapel one day about his grandfather and his grandmother. And he shared the story about how they had everything going for them. They were absolutely in love, more in love than you can ever imagine anyone being. And they, uh, they went to seminary together. And he even shared a, a, a few ex excerpts from a letter that his grandfather wrote his grandmother. And everything went very, very well. Trained for ministry. God put them in the church. They had a family. They were faithful in ministry. And God had blessed their ministry until one day. And I remember Dr. Smith said it like this. My grandfather blew it. He, he had an affair. He left his wife and he ran off with another woman. Which in some ways is bad enough on its own. But he said, you know, my family is a family of preachers. The sons, the, the sons of this relationship all grew up to be in ministry and preach in some capacity. And the only daughter they had married a preacher. And so you look and you say, can there be any forgiveness there? Can the wife forgive ever? Can the sons and grandchildren, can they ever forgive? Can the church, just in general, forgive? Perhaps when we think about lesser things, we, haven't a, we don't have a problem with the answer that Jesus gives. When we think about these massive monumental things that do hurt, that there are consequences to, what does forgiveness look like and what is the horizon or extent of our forgiveness? Well, Jesus has an illustration here to walk us through, perhaps in a very vivid way, what this looks like and gets to the crux of another issue. He begins by giving this parable, what we might call the king's parable in verse 23. He says, For this reason the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. In this and this answer that Jesus gives, this picture that Jesus gives, he really illustrates the answer that he gave to Peter. He gives us a picture of what this, I guess you would say, unlimited forgiveness looks like. And he begins very strategically, doesn't he? For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle, who went out to settle 
his death. I, I want to show you there's really three scenes within this parable that Jesus gives to illustrate this point or answer this question that Peter's asked. And I want us to look at these, and I'll try to be brief, but, but I want you to see all of these. First of all, in verses 23 through 27, we see what we might call the servant's begging and the king's forgiveness. Just listen. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he had begun to settle them, one who owed him ten thousand talents was brought to him but since he did not have the means to repay his lord commanded him to be sold along with his wife and children and all that he had and repayment to be made so the slave fell to the ground and prostrated himself before him saying have patience with me and I will repay you everything and the lord of that slave felt compassion and released and forgave him the Debt. There's, there's a few things that we need to know in this first scene about the, the servants begging and how the king responds. First of all, Jesus does this on purpose. The amount that he gives is astronomical that this slave owned. I understand we don't deal, you don't go to Walmart and give them a denarii or a talent, so perhaps we don't completely grasp the weight of what it is that this servant owed. A talent, one talent in that day and time was the largest coinage that existed. And depending on the exchange rate or who you talk to, one talent was worth 4,000 to 6,000 denarii. You remember what a denarii is, right? It's one day's wage for a common day laborer. And one talent is worth four to 6,000 of those. And this guy owed 10,000 of that. Now bear with me for just a moment because Jesus does this on purpose. You understand that the amount the guy owned would never and could never be paid back. The guy could never pay this amount back. He could work a hundred lifetimes over and on his own. He did not have the ability to make restitution for what he owed the king. It could never be made up for. He could never do it on his own. That is part of the crux of what Jesus is getting at. So you would think that what the guy would say or what the guy would do is he would begin to beg for releasing of the debt. That somehow the king would find it in his heart to forgive him the debt. And you say, well, Adam, that's exactly what he did. No, look again. He doesn't ask for forgiveness. He doesn't ask for releasing of the debt. You know what he asked for? You know what his request essentially, if you boil it down, is for? Time. Give me time and I will pay every bit of it back. He couldn't do that. To some extent, this is letting us in. And I don't want to go too far with this because this is a parable that Jesus is using. He probably just made it up on the spot. But understand, this gets a little bit into the psychology of the slave. He still doesn't get it. The problem here is he thinks he's self-sufficient. He actually believes somehow he, he may be able to scheme, he may be able to find a way, and he on his own will be able to pay back what he owes the king. His debt is too great. The problem again, and this isn't the first time we've seen it, we dealt with it a little bit when we talked about uh, the, the Beatitudes. The issue here is the man is self-righteous. He thinks somehow on his own he's going to be able to arrive at this righteousness before the king. But maybe in the midst of all of this, is the king's response. The, the king does two things that we can't miss. The king does more than the guy asked for, and he does more than the guy could ever do for himself. The guy doesn't ask for forgiveness, but that's exactly what the king gave him. The guy could never pay that back the amount on his own, but the king releases him from that debt. He, he does more than the guy asked, and he does more than the guy could ever ask for himself. 
That, that's the heart of our God in the gospel. We can never pay the debt back that is owed before a holy God because of our sin. We can't do it. But yet somehow in the midst of all that, God sends someone to do it for us that is holy and righteous before him and that makes the payment, the restitution that we owe. That's the heart of God and that's the picture of forgiveness. This king gives forgiveness greater than what the man could achieve on his own and more than what the man ask for. That's not the end of the parable. We would love it if it ended. I'd love it if it ended there. Great. That's the heart of the king. Praise God. There's nothing I need to learn from this. I can just worship Jesus and we can all go home. But he doesn't end there. The story continues because remember the point is the kingdom of heaven is like and it's answering the question that Peter has asked. So it doesn't stop with the servants begging and the king's forgiveness. No, in verse 28 we see a shift. Character change. You move from one servant and the king to another servant and the first servant. And what you see here is the second servant's begging and the first servant's judgment. Verse 28. But the slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And he seized him and began to choke him saying, pay back what you owe. So his fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him saying, have patience with me and I will repay you. But he was unwilling and went and threw him in prison until he should pay back what was owed. Now this is an almost repeat of the first scene with two or three key changes. The first thing you need to understand is this is no longer the debt of a lesser to a greater. This is the debt of a lesser to a lesser. It's not the lesser owing the king. It's the lesser owing someone that's on equal plane with him. The other thing that you need to understand, the other difference that we need to recognize is the amount that's owed. Look, 100 denarii is a lot. But it ain't 10,000 talents. Let me say it another way. It would be hard, perhaps, for this person or any common day laborer to pay back 100 denarii, but it's not impossible. There is a possibility that the guy could work, that he could have a strategy, that he could save, and one day he could pay back this guy all he owed. It's possible. But did you notice the last change? The response of the lesser to the lesser does not follow the pattern of the response of the greater to the lesser in the first scene. Whereas the king did more, what was in his power to do, and more than the guy asked, The lesser to the lesser is not willing to budge one inch. He doesn't follow the pattern. He doesn't reciprocate what was just given to him. Instead, he stonewalls and does the exact opposite. Acts in judgment towards the person, not in forgiveness. Now that's what happened. But perhaps here's what really happened. You're working as... Strange as this scenario might seem, just try to bear with me. You're working for a financial institution or a bank of some sort. And slowly but surely, the bills begin to add up. So much so that you know you don't have the resources on your own to continue to do the things that need to get get done. Perhaps you have a massive massive natural catastrophe and you don't have the insurance to replace, replace your house or the things in your house. Maybe a loved one unexpectedly gets some type of illness that you don't have insurance to take care of. And so even though it might have seemed unthinkable to you at one one time, you control the books at the institution you work for, so you slowly but surely begin to cook the books a little bit and embezzle money until it reaches an astronomical amount over the months and years, an amount that you would never be able to repay, that reaches perhaps into the millions. And everything seems to be going okay until they have an external audit and they find out what's happened and know that you're the only one that could have possibly done this. And so they call you in and they confront you and you have no leg to stand on. And all you know to do is to throw yourself on the floor and explain what happened and begin to beg for release of this debt or somehow time with everything that you have in the rest of your life to repay it. 
and the amazing thing happens that would never happen in this world. They don't just say, we'll give you time, but they say, we forgive you that debt. We're not going to call the police. Just don't do it again. You can move forward. You still have your job. Just move forward. And so, man, just in a, in a way that, that you can't even put into words, you leave with some type of weight off your shoulder, and you go home. And when you get home, you find an envelope there on the counter that's come in the mail, and you have a rental property. And it's just a modest little apartment that you have somewhere that's just two bedroom, one bath, and you have a family in it that's really been down on their luck financially, and they've sent you their rent for the month. It's only $500, and you take it to the bank, and you deposit it, and two days later, you find out from your bank that the check was no good, that it bounced. And so now you go out and you find that person that owes you $500, and they say to you, oh, oh, look, next week I'll have it. I'll write it for you next week. And you say no, and you call the cops, and you prosecute and persecute them to the fullest extent of the law. Now maybe just a little bit, we see what Jesus is saying and teaching here and what it might look like, the audacity of it in our own life. But that's not where it ends either. See, it goes one step further. We don't just have the servant and the king and the servant and the servant, but now we have a group of servants and the first servant. We see the group of servants report, and we see the king's justice. Look with me beginning in verse 29, excuse me, verse 31. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to their Lord all that had happened. Then summoning him, the Lord said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? And his Lord moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. There, there's several things we can say about this that we don't have time to get into, but one of the things that I find fascinating, and I don't want to go too far with it, but isn't it interesting that we see that fellow servants in the kingdom are the one that report on the actions or wicked actions of another servant within the kingdom. I, I don't have time to go too far in this, but I, I think in light of the context, that may not be by accident. There's something in which... Fellow members of the kingdom are to hold one another who also are in the kingdom accountable within the actions of the kingdom. And they go and they report this and, and, and the king obviously hears the situation and so he calls the first, the first slave back in and now we see a change in the king. We, we no longer see him acting in forgiveness and grace but we see him acting in justice now before we go too far and I wish I had time to unpack this but understand this is not the king in verses 31 through 34 being mean it's not the king being un unrighteous matter of fact it is absolutely the king acting in righteousness and doing what is in his full authority and power to do now I don't want to go too far with this either but understand we talk about God's love which is absolutely true but God's love God's mercy God's forgiveness means very little without God's justice and holiness because God is also a just and holy God and you understand what he gives the, the, the servant here it is not him somehow oppressing him or putting punishment on him that he didn't deserve. No, he's giving the guy exactly what he deserved. And I'll go one step further. He's giving him actually exactly what he asked for. You remember the quest, request. It wasn't for forgiveness. What was it? Time. So what does the king give him? Time. I'll give you exactly what you asked for. Understand that our God, somebody before our holy God is going to pay. Somebody is going to pay for every sin we've committed. You either stand on your own outside of the grace of Christ through faith in him and you pay for your own sins. Or through faith in Christ, God does for you what you can never do for yourself and Jesus has already paid for them on the cross. But God is fully within his right to call to account everything anyone has ever done. It's in his nature. He would be wrong to not. You understand that? And so the king responds ultimately in giving the slave exactly what he asked for. So the question that we might ask is, 
perhaps twofold. So, so what essentially is the point here? And what does it relate to that it seems like perhaps it's unrelated to? Well, let's begin in verse 35 because we don't only see Peter's probing and the king's parable, but ultimately in verse 35 we see the painful point. Here's how it ends. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. Now, this is what it looks like on the surface. It looks like Jesus is saying God's forgiveness of you is, is basically and essentially contingent on you first forgiving others. So it seems like a works, works-based salvation. I don't think that's what Jesus is saying at all. Remember that the question is, or how Jesus began this parable, is the kingdom of heaven may be compared to. In what way is the kingdom of heaven like this parable? In one way, we've already said it, well, it's the king. We see the king's graciousness and the king doing for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. But remember, this is given in response to Peter's question. How many times do I forgive my brother? Now, Peter was asking a question that he didn't even know he was asking. The question that Peter's asking is, how many times does somebody in the kingdom need to forgive others in the kingdom? But in the way that only Jesus can do, Jesus doesn't answer that question. He actually shows him there's a greater, harder question. And it's that question that Jesus answers. It's not how many times does someone in the kingdom need to forgive. The question that Jesus actually answers is, what if someone who claims to be in the kingdom refuses to forgive? And the answer that Jesus gives is startling. He basically says, then you're probably not actually in the kingdom. This is the point. If we call it the ETS or we call it the CIT, here's the point that Jesus is making, right? Jesus is essentially saying to his followers, you cannot give away what you have not experienced. You can't forgive others if you haven't experienced the forgiveness of God truly that's what he's saying essentially in other words he's saying to them he's saying to his followers if you can't forgive it's probably that you don't possess it if you can't forgive it's probably that you've not truly been forgiven by the king to say it to us here's here's the proposition here's the ess for us we can't give away what we don't possess We can't steward forgiveness if we haven't truly experienced the forgiveness of Jesus. And so the call, the point, the application is we must steward forgiveness. We must absolutely be those that give away forgiveness. And if we can't, perhaps it's that we don't possess it. That's what Jesus is getting at. But I, I want you to see this. It perhaps is even just a little broader than that. Did you notice what text that perhaps we don't like, we really don't like when we're in the local church and things are difficult, perhaps we do like it, but we like it for the wrong reasons, immediately precedes verse 21. What's the passage of scripture and where Jesus teaches on what we've commonly come to call church discipline? Verses 18 through 20, it's where Jesus says, here's what you do if your brother sins against you. Here's what you do, and here's how you handle sin in the church. And so we not only see the painful point, I think we see a larger prophet. It's not that Peter's question is ambiguous or out of the blue at all. Now, maybe you would say chronologically these events are put together, but that doesn't mean that Peter answers or asks this question right after Jesus finishes teaching what he taught in verses 15 through 20. But Mark certainly assembles his gospel together in such a way that we're supposed to connect the dots. The idea is this, what do you do within the church if your brother sins against you? And Jesus lays out this process that you go through when your brother sins against you. And on the heels of that, Peter looks and says, that's great, but how many times do I have to forgive that yahoo? When that guy keeps doing that to me in the church, how many times do I have to forgive him? Is seven enough? And Jesus says, no, it's 70 times seven. You see, forgiveness here is intimately connected to and is essentially the point of church discipline. 
Now, if we're not careful, here's what we do with church discipline. We either don't use it at all, or we use it to get away, uh, to get, get rid of those people that we don't like or are giving us problems. And here's what Jesus shows us. Both are wrong. The point of church discipline is not some type of, 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 of retaliation against those that hurt us. No, it's about restoration, and it's about forgiveness. And this is essentially what Jesus is saying. Those in the kingdom must forgive others in the kingdom innumerable times. Those who have sinned against us and wronged the king. We must steward forgiveness within the kingdom. Essentially for us, we must forgive innumerable times those that have sinned against us and hurt us. That's really the point. But there's even a larger context than that. Did you see it? You know what comes in verses 12 through 14? It's one of two places in which Jesus briefly tells the story of the parable of the lost sheep, the one of a hundred, leaving the 99 to go find the one. And then it's on the heels of that that he gives the teaching on church discipline. And then it's on the heels of that that Peter says, how many times? I don't think any of those things are by accident. Essentially, church discipline is intimately connected to going after the lost sheep that's wandered from the fold of God. And if you understand church discipline, that may have never known Jesus in the first place. And church discipline is intimately connected to the point of being a forgiver the way we've been forgiven. So here's a couple applications. If we will steward forgiveness in the, in the kingdom the way the king is calling us to here, there's two things that that might mean. Your forgiveness of your brother might be what God uses to restore an erring brother to the church. You ever think about that? Say it another way. Your lack of forgiveness of a brother might be what Satan uses to drive and keep them away. Can you live with that? I can't. But you know what's even bigger than that in the theology of all the Bible and certainly the New Testament? If you understand the lost sheep and what Jesus is saying about church discipline, your forgiveness might be what ultimately leads someone to faith in Jesus and to the king in the first place. Or to say it negatively, your lack of willingness to forgive might be what keeps someone ultimately outside of the kingdom. That's why forgiveness is so important. And so my mentor, Dr. Stephen Smith, tells this story about his grandfather blowing it. Tom Elliff wrote a book who's one of the sons of Stephen's grandfather called The Red Feather about the events that transpired. And the question on the table, is there any forgiveness? Well, years and years and years and years popped on, and there was no reconciliation. The grandfather went his way, the the grandmother went her way. And there was no reconciliation. There was no noticeable or known forgiveness within that family until later in Jewel's life. Near the end of her life, she had a very serious illness that put her in the hospital and actually in a coma. She was basically non-responsive. And as the end got closer and closer and closer, the doctors called one day and said, you know, basically she's in the last 24 hours of her life. You you need, to get, you need to get to the hospital. So, so there's, the, there's the sons, there's the daughter and the son-in-law and, and grandchildren in the room. Just a, a room full to some extent of, of preachers. And there Jewel is, the grandmother, in the bed, basically unresponsive in any way. And one afternoon while they're waiting on the Lord to take her home, the phone rings. And one of them picks it up. And it was the grandfather. And he had heard what had happened. And he asked if he could speak with Jewel. And they said, well, you know, you probably won't understand anything you say. And he said, well, that's okay. Would you, would you put the phone up to her ear? And so whoever was holding the phone put the phone up to Jewel's ear. And he said, to this day, what I guess no one really knows. And they said they noticed a tear began to run down Jewel's cheek. And the phone call ended, and they're in, they're in the room. And for the rest of her life, until the Lord took her home, Jewel spoke four words. She said, JT, which was her, her ex-husband's name, And three times she said, forgive, forgive, forgive. Now they knew in an instance what she was saying. She wasn't saying that she had forgiven him. She had already done that. She was calling them to forgive him. 
Can I say to you today that that's the type of forgiveness that only a Christ follower can give because only us have experienced it. It's what I would call today extravagant forgiveness. Are you one who in your life is stewarding the gospel by stewarding forgiveness? May it be true of all of us. Pray with me. Gracious Father, thank you for this very true, piercing, yet, Father, convicting teaching of your word. Thank you for showing us the application of the gospel in our lives and through our lives in such a way that you can use to bring the action of what Jesus has done for us on the cross to a world who desperately needs it and in the church, Father, that desperately needs to see it. I pray that you would make all of us Bring us to the point of conviction and make all of us stewards of your forgiveness. Not perfectly, Lord, not perfectly, but in a way that honors your character and glorifies you. And would you use that in our lives as an opportunity to share the gospel with those who don't know you? And would you use that in our churches to restore people and bring people face-to-face with a relationship with you? Again, thank you for the gospel picture in this text and showing us the gospel ethic through it. We pray that you'd be with us now as we go our separate ways this afternoon and that you'd be glorified in all that we do and that you would be with us over Thanksgiving and keep us all safe as we remember ultimately what it is that we have to be thankful for and that's Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we give you and pray these things.